Hello, everybody. Today we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Alice Bertaina from the Division of Hematology, Oncology, Stem Cell Transplantation and uh, Regenerative Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, uh, Stanford University, California, USA. Hello, Alice. How are you? It's a pleasure hi. to have you with us. <laughs> hi, guys, Carmelo, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. This is really exciting and uh, I'm delighted to, to be here. We are very appreciative you accepted our uh, invitation. And today we are going to talk about your um, recent uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, article. So um, uh, let's start uh, with a little bit of background. Can you elaborate uh, on uh, the Schimke immunoosseous dysplasia? And uh, can you tell us uh, some characteristics of the syndromes, uh, some features? Uh, Yes, sure. Well, first of all, Schimke immunosseous dysplasia, SIOD, just for brevity while we talk, is a very rare genetic disorder. Uh, it's a very rare genetic disorder that it can be most often uh, fatal by the age of nine in patients who have the more severe phenotype of the disease. It is uh, due to a biallelic mutations in the gene encoding uh, SMARCA1. Uh, which really um, translates uh, in defect uh, in many, many organs. The main two organs that are affected are the bone marrow uh, and, the, and the kidneys, but not only. Uh, I mentioned these two characteristics because they are really crucial for the work that we have done. These patients have a T cell immunodeficiency, which is mostly um, about the naive compartment. Uh, it, it has been studied and, you know, it has been debated for years uh, if uh, this uh, naive uh, defect is related to the immune deficiency itself uh, or mostly to a problem of uh, pygmic stroma. And I think that our data uh, in terms of immune reconstitution post-transplant show that uh, uh, with a healthy donor immune system, we have a normal um, development of the naive compartment. But just to say that is a very uh, debated point. And they have this uh, glucocorticoid resistant nephrotic syndrome, which uh, eventually progress to focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and therefore end stage kidney disease. Um, beside that, these patients also have a DNA repair defect, which makes them much more uh, sensitive to a genetic agent along with their really uh, problem in, um, in telomere maintenance. So uh, you can understand that for their life, uh, these patients uh, are affected already by um, short stator, a spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, um, along with um, very often um, problems in their thyroid. And of course, uh, these uh, FSGS uh, and T cell immune deficiency, which bring them to be dependent from the dialysis and eventually candidate uh, to, to a kidney transplant. Their main cause of death is though related to the uh, T cell deficiency and the evolution in bone marrow failure syndrome. Infections are reported uh, amongst the main cause of death in these patients. Although patients who live longer uh, mostly die due to strokes and uh, um, aneurysmatic lesions that are really related to their uh, collagen defect in the in the endothelium and that are very difficult to to control in these patients with regular supportive therapy. So we understand that these are like very rare but also very complicated cases that uh, um, you have been. Uh, um, studying on. So, uh, and I understand it's clear the rationale, of course, for uh, the kidney and bone marrow transplantation uh, because of the particular features uh, these uh, little patients have. Uh, can I ask you, um, going a little bit more in details uh, on uh, the bone marrow transplant, which type of plat platforms, uh, platform did you choose? Did you choose? Yes, absolutely. And, and that gives me, you know, the possibility of, uh, of explaining a, a little bit more about the experience uh, with stem cell transplantation in SIOD patients, because these patients represented a challenge from many perspectives. 
represented the challenge, they required a stem cell transplantation and a kidney transplantation. So in one hand, they represented the ideal population to test our hypothesis, but they also had the criticism related, for example, to their uh, DNA repair defect. We couldn't use in these patients a myeloablative conditioning regimen. And in fact, uh, if we look in the, into the literature, there are only five patients with SIOD reported to receive a bone marrow transplantation, which in that case was myeloablative. And there is just one of the patients who is a long-term survival. The other four died because of transplant-related complication, which were mostly graft versus host disease, infection, and toxicity overall related to the conditioning regimen. So the first question was really, how can we uh, design a reduced toxicity conditioning regimen that can have these patients and grafting, but... Uh, not being too toxic, and how we can avoid uh, severe graft versus host disease, uh, which can be deleterious in these patients uh, who are so fragile. And so that's why we decided to use the platform of the alpha beta T cell depletion, uh, which we have established in a really large number of patients with different non malignant disorders, including. Uh, Fanconi anemia patients, for example, or other telomeropathies that gave us a good uh, basis to believe that that approach was uh, uh, tolerable by this category of patients. And uh, uh, the other challenge that these patients represented is that they were on um, end-stage renal disease. Two of them were on dialysis. One of them was a CKD stage 3. So uh, the conditioning regimen was designed, first of all, to be a reduced toxicity. And I really translated the experience that we had with the Fanconi anemia patients because it was the closest population in terms of specificity. But then we needed really to consider uh, the renal uh, insufficiency. And therefore, um, the real-time evaluation of fludarabine PK was incredibly helpful. Uh, and is something that really... Um, impacted a lot in the outcome of these patients, both in the patient in dialysis and in that patient who was not in dialysis yet. We were able to modulate the dose and actually we ended up in giving much less glutamine that we were supposed to just based on the body weight and even in the estimate clearance. So it's something which we need really to consider now that is available for, uh, for this category of patients. Um, I think that the strategy of overall using the alpha-beta cell depletion was uh, successful because none of these patients develop significant graft versus host disease. Actually, just one of them developed a transient gray true skin only GHD, which was treated with very low dose of, um, of steroids. And on the other end, the neuroconstitution was uh, great. In fact, all these patients went to uh, a kidney transplantation already having a basically a normal T cell function, which uh, allow us to, you know, do not have viral complication after the kidney transplantation, which is one of the main problems in, uh, in this group of patients. Thank you. That's very um, uh, interesting. So you uh, had like basically you design uh, a very tailored uh, conditioning arrangement uh, that was also uh, adjusted according to the individual patient pharmacokinetics. So, um, uh, we, uh, what uh, was uh, this um, uh, the, uh, the um, conditioning regimen based on? You said fludarabine and. So it was low dose of fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, mm -hmm. and then had a 200 centigrade of uh, total body irradiation, mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the backbone of immune modulation with uh, ATG and uh, angiotoximab. Okay. And how about engraftment and chimerism data instead? Yes. So the engraftment was really rapid and robust in all three patients without really any, any difference in comparison with the other normal patients that we, that we have treated overall with this platform. Uh, we have neutrophil engraftment uh, as average by day 12 and then platelet the engraftment by day 15. Um, chimerism, we have two donor chimerism uh, since the engraftment for patients one and patient three. Um, and the chimerism didn't, you know, um, 
modify uh, between the, the actual engraftment and the last follow-up, which is now over 34 months post kidney transplantation, so uh, longer for post stem cell transplantation. For patient number two, who is the patient, uh, um, interestingly, where the cellularity of the bone marrow was a little higher, about 40%, while in the other two was already below 10%. We had an initial mixed climatism uh, that anyway was always above 80% of donor cells and became a full donor by day 150. Uh, post stem cell transplantation. All of these uh, in without pharmacological immune suppression, like is typical of the alpha beta T cell depletion. So uh, it, it was a very, um, I would say, very standard um, recovery in terms of hematopoietic uh, and, uh, and, 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 lymph and lymphoid um, engraftment in these patients. I see. So basically, uh, what um, what we can uh, infer is that, like, perhaps this little hump of patient number two was just because uh, he or she, I don't remember, like the, the gender she. of this uh, little patient, she had like still some like uh, um, uh, good cellularity, and therefore, like, perhaps the reduced intensity uh, might have like caused a little bit of delayed uh, full chimerism. The other hypothesis is related to the, to the SNAPAL1 mutation. We do not have data enough on that. We need to, you know, because there are not so many SOD patients transplanted. But again, interestingly, the father of this patient, who was the stem cell donor, had a, an hypomorphic mutation of SNAPAL1, which was a, a, a little different from the other two, the one of the mother and the one of the father of the other family. And so a possibility is also that really uh, the donor cells uh, were less uh, able to right away overcome the, uh, the presence of any way, just a partial immune deficiency. That's an important point, uh, you know, especially in the, in the perspective of broadening this approach to other diseases. It is true that the patients have a cell immune deficiency, but they are not comparable to severe immune deficiency. All of them had antibodies, for example, before the stem cell transplantation and had some level of response to vaccination as well as, you know, T cell function evaluated by, by PHA. So it's really a partial immune deficiency, which means that still we have to overcome uh, some uh, potential risk of rejection. Right. So turning now to the kidney transplantation part, uh, when was that performed? Uh, did the patient receive any periprocedural immunosuppressive treatment? So the kidney transplantation was performed between five and 10 months post stem cell transplantation. Uh, we do not know what is the sweet spot for that. And I would say that really the timing of the kidney transplantation has been mostly dictated by the nutritional status of these patients. Uh, my colleagues on the on the renal team really were very felt very strong about waiting for the surgery until the patient was really able to have an adequate uh, caloric intake to do not compromise the uh, the healing of the process. And then for patients too, we were in the middle of the pandemic. And so we postponed the kidney transplantation that was planned also for about five months post-transplant because it, it was the beginning. And, you know, we didn't feel mostly for the donor to, to put him at risk of, uh, of, of getting the infection. Um, is that the ideal timing? I'm not sure. I mean, from an immunological perspective, I would almost say that doing that earlier might make more sense. Um, but again, we have to face the reality that for these specific patients are patients who are in enteral nutrition and they have another layer of complexity. So it's not just the, the, the immunological balance. Um, in terms of immunosuppression, so of course we were terrified by the idea that those patients could develop uh, either rejection or graft-versus disease after the kidney transplantation. And despite the fact that they were 100% chimeric on the CD3 subset, we decided to really be uh, extremely cautious. 
and utilize a peritransplantation immune um, prophylaxis, which was done with a very low dose of steroids and with tacrolimus that we targeted between five and eight, so a lower level that we usually do. Um, for patients number one and number three, we um, actually, sorry, for patients number one and number two, we stopped with immunosuppression by day 30. It was exactly day 30 for the first patient, and you can imagine that we were much more nervous for him. For patient two, I think it was 27 or around. For patient number three, actually, we had a, she developed, we had a surprise because she developed a, a severe hyperglycemia after starting the steroids and the tacro. Um, and basically, we had to stop the steroids on day five and the tacro on day 12. And everything went really smoothly. So again, I think that this peritransplant immune suppression is mostly for control our anxiety and not for really controlling a risk on the patients. But as long as one month, I, I don't think it compromised anything and makes, uh, you know, especially me and Dr. Green sleep a little bit more hours. Yeah, and I can definitely understand and I feel you when you <laughs> express uh, a little bit of anxiety when uh, we talk about uh, this very unknown field because uh, it's really like uh, very um, experimental uh, at this point uh, since uh, very few data in the literature if nothing uh, are present. Uh, so how about instead the uh, journey of uh, these little patients uh, after a transplant. Uh, we mentioned like about the um, actual kidney transplant, but um, did they experience any other, any adverse event, uh, um, GDHD, for instance, or infections uh, along the way? They really did very uneventfully uh, and much better than we, than we thought. Uh, graft versus disease wise, um, Patient number one uh, developed this uh, grade two skin only GHD, which was controlled with uh, less than one milligram per kg of steroids and uh, completely resolved just with that treatment. Patients number two and number three didn't develop any acute GHD, nor anybody develop uh, chronic graft versus osteotis. And now we have uh, a follow up, which is uh, about 14 months after the stem cell transplant for the first patient and about 26 for the third. So that's the range. Uh, viral infection, uh, we had just uh, a transient uh, HHV6 viremia that we treated with valgancyclovir, but nothing that you know required admission for the treatment or who impacted the counts. They didn't have CMV reactivation. Remarkably, they didn't have uh, BK viremia, uh, after the kidney transplantation, which is again a very important point because this is something that usually bothers the, the post transplant course of, uh, uh, of a kidney transplantation. Um, so I don't really, I don't have so much toxicity to, to report. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, we are totally which happy. Is, <laughs> which is great. I think that the main challenge is going to be, I mean, from my perspective, is that how much the transplant is going to impact on the rest of the complication. For example, I'm very, really curious to understand if an early stem cell transplantation can impact the endothelium and therefore can reduce the risk of these vascular related complications, which are so dramatic for these patients. Uh, these three SIOD kids didn't have major um, problems before the transplant, we have screened them all with an MRI and array exactly to make sure that from a angiogram perspective, there were, you know, no big abnormalities that we need to be aware of. Um, and so far, they didn't have any event, but of course, uh, we will see uh, on the on the long term. But I think that from an SID perspective, really understanding if this an early stem cell transplantation can impact on the other organs, uh, affected by by this marker one mutation, it's uh, it's a big uh, it's a big question. And uh, do you have any data on the immune reconstitution instead following the um, bone marrow transplantation? We already discussed about the, the infection, so I gather if 
potentially they didn't have like so many infection. This is because probably also the immune reconstitution work like uh, along the way yeah. and the T cell uh, probably uh, became functional and active very soon thereafter. Uh, perhaps this might also explain why they didn't have uh, like uh, the common uh, complication we uh, are used to see in both uh, these type of transplants. Um, did you, do you have any data on this? Yes, sure. Um, so first of all, the first two patients uh, also received an head back of donor-derived lymphocyte, which uh, were uh, genetically modified with a suicide gene for the um, invisible cascade line. Uh, when uh, the reason being that really when we started when when we started this project uh, the uh, the clinical trial uh, with uh, the at the back of these T cells was still ongoing and so we had the possibility of having this manif the cells manufactured uh, and to have a, a single patient IND for them. Um, and my my reasoning you know behind using the cells was exactly trying to give them, uh, some more maturity cells post-transplant that could uh, uh, mitigate the risk of infection. For patient number three, uh, this cells manufacturing was not available anymore, so she didn't receive. And I would say that between these three, across the three patients, the immune reconstitution was pretty much superimposable. Uh, so the patients who received the, the, the rivo cells, the IC9 modified cells, didn't necessarily have a, a much more expedited immune reconstitution. I think that the most important highlight to, to, to tell you about the reconstitution was uh, the actually um, emergence of naivety cells, uh, uh, which happened about three months post stem cell transplant, although they had um, significant absolute numbers uh, at six months post transplantation. Um, so, uh, to me, again, from an SID perspective, it means that. Their time was works. They just need uh, healthy T cells that can, and healthy stem cell actually that can mature. Um, they had a norm, they all of them had a normal T cell function uh, measured uh, by, by responsiveness to PHA uh, before the kidney transplantation. So that's again, it, um, it is between five and, and 10 months post stem cell transplantation, which is pretty consistent. If, if I think about our overall cohort uh, of alpha beta transplanted patients, uh, about 50% of them achieve a normal physical function by six months post-transplant. Of course, these patients uh, were chemo naive uh, before they approach, so they, they could have a, had an advantage in terms of this immune constitution than a leukemia patient, for example. Um, but yes, I would say that those are the main uh, the main highlight in terms of immune constitution. Thank you. That's like really fascinating, uh, knowing that these uh, three kids had very limited, uh, if basically nothing, uh, of immunosuppress immunosuppression, and uh, particularly when thinking about. Uh, um, complication, uh, short and long term effect inherent to these drugs. Uh, do you think this strategy can be applied also in other settings? Uh, and if so, where do you envision this strategy to be success successful? Thank you for this question, because this is really the core you know, of all this work. As I said at the beginning, SIOD and these patients represent the ideal proof of concept that this approach can work in terms of tandem approach, in terms of tailoring a conditioning regimen on a patient in chronic kidney failure, uh, and so on. So yes, I believe that this approach can work in other indications. And actually, uh, while the paper was getting out uh, on May 27, the FDA approved a, a new um, clinical trial that we are going to start very soon. And in this clinical trial, we are going to test our hypothesis in other renal diseases, which will be, uh, in this case, cystinosis and uh, autoimmune-mediated focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and lupus, uh, heritomatosis systemic with uh, class 4 and 5 nephritis. Um, 
we need to start from some indications and then expand like we did for SIOD. Uh, the challenge that we are going to have is of course uh, the commission arrangement that cannot be uh, the same uh, that we use for SIOD. But I would say, uh, you know, a, that we actually have designed a different condition arrangement and that we have treated already uh, two patients uh, with a full immunocompetent system achieving a 100% engraftment. So I think that I'm, I, I feel confident about the fact that we can engraft those patients. The main challenge will be avoid graft associated disease in patients in which a pre-existing inflammatory milieu uh, can, of course, impact. Those are patients uh, who have seen in their life a lot of immunosuppressive therapies, a lot of transfusion, uh, who previously failed maybe already a clinic transplant, and so they got exposed to other antigens. So I would anticipate that the risk of having a uh, graft versus disease is going to be higher in that population. So that's something to consider. And then on a research basis, it will be very important to understand and dissect so that we can potentially tailor, again, prophylaxis ad hoc to minimize it. But um, overall, uh, I think that the direction is really to, to translate this approach to other indications and hopefully in the near future also to other organs like the liver and eventually the, the intestine because the, it, it is really, it is dramatic on how miserable is the quality of life of patients who receive a solid organ transplant. And uh, I think we have the possibility of making these patients independent from lifelong immune suppression. And we, we made some step forward. So, so now we need to continue and, uh, and try to get to the, to the final goal. Thank you so much, Alice. Alice, this is really terrific. And we are all eager to know and see more of your work. Uh, I might a little bit biased because, you know, I'm a previous mentee of yours, <laughs> but I'm sure everybody will uh, agree with me. And uh, today has been uh, amazing hearing uh, from uh, uh, yourself the story of uh, these patients and uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us uh, an overview of uh, your uh, research work. Thank you Carmelo, thank you, thank you to the EVMP. It has been a, a, a really a pleasure to be here especially with you and uh, looking forward to the next uh, uh, achievements. Thank you so much.